Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Uh, you may have noticed there's rather a lot of fuss was made about a week ago about the fact that Paul McCartney was marking his 80th birthday. And uh, people were celebrating about the fact that they'd spent their entire lives, it seemed, with Paul McCartney. Well, I say our guest today comes a very close second behind that because I've, I've, I've lived out my life by the records of Loudon Wainwright III. And here he is, Loudon. And me too. Very nice <laughs> very to, good see to see you. you. Hello, guys. How nice are you? you? Okay. And where are you? I am at home. It's it's in a place called Shelter Island, New York. Oh, I it's, know it. You do? Yeah, I went on holiday there once. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's out on the end of eastern Long Island, about three three hours uh, from New York City, and it's a, a great spot to shelter. Well, like Loudney's here. Loudney's here because he's got, um, he's got a new record coming out soon called Lifetime Achievement. And he's also <laughs> going to be touring in the UK in September. Um, I've actually, it, I've, I haven't got your first album, but I've got, I've got two oh, yeah. copies, two copies of your second here, Larry. Yes, Does we've that been going count? through the roof here and getting some stuff out. Yeah. Wow. And um, let's start as we normally do in these chats by asking people, can you remember the record playing equipment that was in your home when you were a child? Uh. Well, my dad, you know, who was a, a great music lover and listener uh, and, and a bit of a, I wouldn't say audiophile, but but he he had a, a really high end, uh, you know, hi fi system, as they right. used to call them back in the late 50s and early 60s. And, uh, you know, I, I probably wasn't allowed to touch it. As I got older, I, I, I would sneak in and put my big cost uh, headphones on and and listen to, to music. But uh, as far as myself goes, I had a little, uh, you know, I had one of those things where I could play my 45s with the, the spindle. Uh, a dance set? Pardon? A dance set, that kind of thing? I guess so, yeah. I mean, it was blue. I remember that. I mean, we're going <laughs> back. We're going way back. You know, the first, first actual record I bought was all shook up. Elvis Presley oh, right. it was a single. Was that a 78, a 78 or a 45? No, it was a 45. I had some 78s, but they were given to me. I had some Fats Domino 78s and um, a few others from that era. But uh, So what were, your, what were your parents playing? Can you remember the kind of stuff that they'd put on the record? Player? I can totally remember. I mean, again, my dad was the, the decider as to what got played. But he had a, a very wide-ranging, eclectic uh, appreciation. You know, there was... Um, jazz and classical music a lot of uh broadway uh you know frank lesser guys and dolls my fair lady um you know south pacific the, the great broadway shows of that time Fantastic. but he also you know had a, a lead belly record and uh some jazz you know kid ori he even had a joan baez record of all things uh so um he had wide ranging tastes, and I, 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 I benefited from that. I'd say, right. So Elvis Presley was your first enthusiasm. First well, that was the first one that I actually bought. You know, that was probably in 1956 when I was 10. Right. Can you remember where you bought records? What the store was like? Well, it was in a town I think called Mount Kisco, or if if I've got the town right, it is Mount Kisco. And it was a kind of a, they, they had books there and stationery there. And there wasn't an actual record shop. No. It was just a kind of an all purpose thing. Yeah. But that's, I think that's where I would have bought it. Right, right. Well, have you got any old records? Do you keep your old records? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, not, I, obviously, I don't have as many old records as you do, David. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have about, uh, I grabbed a few oldies. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, people that my dad loved, I've got this Tom Lehrer record. Oh, oh wow. You know, oh, who, Maria, who gee, is, it's good to see you doing the Vatican rag. Yeah, yeah. You know, be prepared. The old dope peddler. Yes. <laughs> you know, which you probably could not sing today. A lot of these <laughs> you couldn't sing today. No, you couldn't. But uh, I want to go back to Dixie. Anyway, he was a, a huge, uh, I think he was a real influence on me because, of course, he liked to write funny songs. Yeah. And uh, as do I. 
so that was in that collection. Uh, uh, here's a guy who can do the funny stuff and the not funny stuff, Roger Miller. Oh, yes. oh right. Dang me. Oh, yeah. He ought to take sounds... a rope and hang me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chug a lug. <laughs> you know, I, I, I suppose you could find some of my stuff in the folk bins, record bins. I was a great fan of the Holy Mode Rounders. Oh, oh yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, Peter Stamfeld and, and Steve Weber, um, who were also uh, original members of the Fugs. Remember yes. the Fugs? Yes, we do. Yeah. We're getting pretty arcane now, folks. Yeah. That's fine. You're, you're, you're know, in the right company. That's turf. You're among friends. And let's <laughs> go UK same. here. You know, this is, these are the boys of the lock. I was friends oh, right. with all these yeah. guys. My right. dear friend Robin Morton passed away uh, this year. He was, but that's Ali Bain over there and Dick Gotham and yeah, Cathal McConnell. So, right, you know, that's that's some of the ones I picked up. Right, Tom Lira, tell me, is Tom Lira still with us? He is. He lives in Cambridge. He yeah, he's he's in his nineties, um, and I I'm. He, I've, I have had a, a email correspondence with him. Um, I have a song, a novelty song uh, called "My Meds," which is about all the medications that I take, and uh, I, I heard a piano on it. So I got in touch with him. A friend of mine had his email address, and I and I wrote to him and said uh, and asked him if he would be willing to to play the piano on this uh, kind of bouncy little thing. And he graciously declined, <laughs> but he had, he, he was, a, had a funny pithy response. And in the song, I, I, I mentioned Mercurochrome. I don't know if you know what that is, but it was this thing that no, you used no, to put no. on when you'd get a scratch or a cut. And he was delighted to hear that word in a song. Right. That's what he told me. His that was memory his, so was astonishing, wasn't it? Just the, yeah. sheer, the tracts of lyric that he would he could recite at incredible speed. It was and if you look at his shows, which you can, of course, see on YouTube, they're so funny. And the in-between song patter. He's a great comedian with great funny timing and um, uh, acts, acts one, one of the very great ones, I'd say. So you talk about you couldn't do a load. Tom Lira, if he still performed, couldn't do there's lots of songs he couldn't do anymore. Do you have to do the same thing with your catalogue? There are some songs <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that uh, I, I, I get a little nervous singing. Or if I'm going to sing it, uh, I'll, I'll give the audience a heads up. You know, right. you, you held up my second album, album yeah. two. Yeah. What a creative title that was. <laughs> and uh, I uh, on that is a track called Motel Blues. Absolutely. Oh, I used to love that song. W <laughs> which is about being lonely and, you know, uh, trying to meet women in the workplace, as it were. And, <laughs> you know, there's a line in it where I say, come up to my motel room and sleep with me. Yeah. And now I don't know. <laughs> I could get into trouble. I'm, maybe I'm in trouble now. <laughs> at this point it's all right i can handle it right so there so are there, you, there you do yeah, there sing are songs. Them, you... well no i would sing that song i i right. i i i've always seen part of my job as uh you know uh pushing the envelope to use the expression making the uh -huh. audience a little bit nervous uh um I, it, it engages them and keeps them involved in the set so, um, but as you say, it's, it's, it's getting trickier and trickier as to what can be sung and said and written and everything else. Who were the key people who, who really, uh, you know, inspired you? I think, I think I remember you saying you'd been to, uh, you went to, to Newport in 1963 and saw Dylan. I mean, were there, were there any major moments that were, were, were kind of... Well, that was a major moment. You know, I hitchhiked up, up there uh, from... Uh, you know, the suburban town outside of New York that I lived in with my parents with my guitar and my sleeping bag. And indeed, uh, I saw Dylan pre-electric and, and post-electric. I saw both both those shows and, and it was mesmerizing. He was, you know, he's five years older than me, but it, it, it felt like 
I mean, he was a contemporary and to see him sing and play uh, with just the guitar uh, was astounding. And, uh, and then, then I, I was there the famous night that, uh, you know, he went electric with those guys, uh, Mike Bloomfield and some of the people in uh, the Paul Butterfield blues band. And that was, uh, you know, the audience that night was split. I'd say half of them hated it and were booing and saying, get off and everything. And, uh, but I was in the other half. I was just, I thought it was fabulous right. uh, and exciting. And uh, so the Dylan experiences at Newport were, were very strong and for me. So tell us about this new record, Lifetime Achievement. I think you say that you, 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 when you made your first record, you wanted to make a record about being in your early 20s. And now this is making a record about being in your mid-70s. Can we say that? Yeah, mid-70s. Coming up on 76. Well, there's um, a song called How Old is 75, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> and the second line is... Alive. It's a number that's weighted. In five years, you'll be 80. Poised yeah, on yeah. the high diving board. Is that right? Yeah, it's brilliant. That's it, yeah. Well, you know, I've always written about uh, and been somewhat obsessed about getting old, even when I was young. I mean, the, the first uh, line, the first lyric in the first song on my first album is in Delaware when I was younger. Oh, so there's always been this thing of, of uh, I'm young, I'm going to get old. I'm, and now, of course, I'm really old. So... Um, why not write about, why not continue to write about it? But the record Lifetime Achievement, um, how can I, I mean, there are, there are some, I'd say almost uncharacteristically optimistic songs. L love songs, dare I say, you know, I've been living for eight years with a lovely woman called Susan Morrison. And, uh, you know, uh, it, Nice to have somebody to love during the pandemic, for sure. And and uh, but but uh, some of that stuff is reflected in the record. But then it's also, I have a kind of cynical, sarcastic song called "Fam Vac," which is short for <laughs> family family vacation. Oh, it's so funny, like going on a family yeah. vacation on your own, isn't it? Right, right. Uh, I want to leave the fucking family at home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so you know, it's it's. Uh, it's a kind of mixed bag of, of various things. And then there's some great players on it. My dear friend, Haim Tannenbaum uh, and David right. Mansfield, who I, who have played on my records for years are on it and some great other musicians. So it, it's, uh, it was a fun record to make. So how long have you known somebody like David Mansfield? Cause that really goes back. doesn't it? Well, David probably, uh, I'd say with David, it would have been early 80s with Haim. All right, right, go on. Who grew up with Kate McGarrigal, my first wife, in Montreal. Haim is over 50 years, you know, I mean, right. and he uh, is one of my dearest friends. And, and again, a guy who I just love to sing and play with. And uh, we'll take the opportunity to do that anytime I can. So do you, do you kind of find yourself looking at each other, thinking... I can't believe we're still doing this. <laughs> uh, yeah, but then we do it. You know, I mean, no, uh, good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's. Uh, no, it's a wonderful thing to to uh, to have this. I'm grateful to have, to have this job and to be able to go up and sing these songs in front of people with people that I love playing and singing with. Um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, been a wonderful uh, lifetime achievement, I suppose, or a pursuit anyway. Right. So there's no sense that this record's the last one. It's just the latest one. Uh, I hope so. I, <laughs> I hope it's the latest. I, I don't know. Um, there's no way of knowing, but... Um, it has an, an element of, of summing up to a degree. It does. Agree. No, it yeah. really does. There's a bit where you talk about uh, your father dying, I think, when he was 64. And I remember seeing your your show, L Liner Notes show in, in, in Leicester Square. You mean uh, uh, Surviving Twin? Surviving Twin. Yeah. yeah. Talking about your father. 
Yeah. And uh, that, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And that's obviously a significant moment. You suddenly realize that you're living longer than your own father did. So, right. Of- I had a whole album called Older Than My Old Man Now. And uh, yeah, my dad, uh, who died relatively young, I mean, he was just short of his uh, 63rd birthday. Yeah. And his father died when he, uh, my grandfather, was uh, 42. So uh, this could be my last album. <laughs> if, if you look at the genet- genetics, it's, 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 the deck is stacked. <laughs> so do you, you, you're going on tour in the UK. You're looking forward to this. Do you, do you relish the idea of touring? Well, the, 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 I relish the idea of getting there and playing. You know, I wish I could be teleported onto the, into the venues. I hate the traveling in the motels and all that jazz and have done for, for probably 35 years, hated it. But this is a tour that, um, you know, I was supposed to do three years ago, and then you know yeah. what happened. I mean, th- this tour has been uh, postponed twice now. So... Uh, three time lucky or whatever that expression is. I hope I make it over there, but I'm, I'm excited to go, you know, I'm going to play up and down the country and go over to Ireland and play too. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. How do you go about putting together a show for a tour like this? Well, I, uh, you know, I'll play songs certainly from the new record, uh, you know, uh, uh, songs that people haven't heard me perform but I'll sing some of the older songs. And uh, I'm also doing this thing, uh, you know, we, we mentioned uh, this show I did, uh, uh, Surviving Twin, yeah. which was a kind of theatrical piece. I, I you know, where I read uh, or, or perform some of my father's writing. In this show I'm gonna do uh, in the fall, I will put the guitar down and actually perform a few things that I have written um, and then fo- connect connect things with songs so there's a kind of so there's uh, a narrative things those are those are spoken yeah. word things yeah yeah there's a you know i have a piece for instance called monsters which is about um my obsession as a kid uh with monster movies you know frankenstein dracula the bride of frankenstein you know those great old movies that and the hammer horror films of course yeah so i i i I wrote something about that a few years ago well now i perform it in the show and i think the audience is it's interesting you know instead of song joke song joke or it's uh you know it's kind of allows the audience to see something different and hear something differently you ever think you should have done i mean not you in particular but just generally that the, the, these are things maybe sh- people should have done earlier in their career and get away well, from song joke, song joke, as you put it. Uh, well, yes, I, we mentioned how I love how I loved Tom Lear's in, 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 in uh, between the song patter. I mean, uh, I mean, some people don't say anything. Certainly Bob Dylan is not famous for his no. in the song <laughs> no, no. patter, although he can say some pretty great stuff. But uh, uh, occasionally tells he, jokes, which is very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I studied to be an actor. I thought that's what I was going to be. I went to drama school in the late 60s. So, uh, you know, I have a tendency to, to want to, you know, uh, p- perform in that in that mode also. So it's uh, and I'm 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 uh, letting that uh, tendency loose and free and doing it right. So when you're touring, you're preparing for a tour, which is just you on stage. Do you do you rehearse? And if so, how do you do it? Well, I go downstairs into my little cave, my room, and you know, play the songs and try to remember the songs. I mean, I mean, I, the other day I had to go on Wikipedia to find the lyrics to a song that I forgot. <laughs> Which you know, was that? Uh, it was a song it's a song called aphrodisiac which right. was on a record i made in the 80s called therapy but you know I, I had completely forgotten how some of it went so but you can check that now so i yes. so i relearn my songs and then uh you know i just per- play them play for an hour a day or something like that and then uh 
Well, there has to be some sp- standard now to, to, to completely acceptable for people to come on with kind of with teleprompters, isn't it? And with lyric sheets and things, because there's just so much to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've occasionally gone up, as, as they say in the biz, you know, where I, I, I've forgotten. Corpsed is another acting term when you forget your lines. And I've had situations in shows where I've been in the middle of a song and forgotten a lyric and someone from the audience will prompt we'll remember it yeah yeah you know a real loud head will perk up and give me the lyric which is a which is a nice moment for everybody i've seen you i've seen you play quite a few times and you're, you're so good at dealing with audiences and so good at just being being reactive I, 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 have you ever had a a, a a kind of heckling any any way you deal with any hecklers or any uh uh, yeah, I've been heckled and uh, I actually have a song called The Heckler. <laughs> uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of stages of it. It, it depends. I yeah. mean, again, in the beginning of my career in the 70s, you know, when I would go up to a place like Glasgow or uh, D- Dublin or, or any town, really, uh, you know, half the audience would be drunk. I mean, really drunk. I mean, I, I once had a show in Inverness where that was in the front page of the, the local paper. The audience was so drunk that they had to kind of kick everybody out of the venue. The name of the venue was the Eden Court, I remember. But anyway, that's a that's a certain type of heckling. But if, if it's just somebody needling me from the audience, you know, there are various tricks. And uh, basically what you do is you kind of warn them a little bit. Or first you ask. How do you them do that? Now, how do you do that? It's, it's, well, you start. You, you the first step is to ask them to stop. Would you mind? Yeah. Stop doing that. And if they don't, then you kind of say, you get angrier and convey that. And and then the next, the final trick is to turn the rest of the audience against them. <laughs> so uh, you know somehow they're humiliated. But uh, you know it's it, that's one of the great things about doing live shows is it's uh, anything can happen and and does so um there's been a lot of interesting fun weird things on and off stage uh, in the last 50 years at these shows who who you personally admire that you see live who you think that person does something i could never do a, a musician or any, yeah, any, kind well, of, any, any yeah. entertainer yeah uh Well, you know, I mean, I love I mean, the music that I listen to now. I, I don't listen to other singer songwriters. That's my idea of a bad time. You know, <laughs> let's let's check out the new John Prine record. So what, why don't you? Is it, well, I don't really understand uh, the, that because it's either you know you're 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 kind of feel that something's not up to scratch, or else you feel probably that they've done something brilliant. Right, it's what we song. call the compare and despair yeah. el- <laughs> element. You know, uh, so I don't want to hear some great song that, that I wish I could have written. Yeah. So um, I kind of <laughs> listen to uh, to safe stuff that, yeah. uh, you know, non non singing music, a lot of jazz, yeah. a lot of Thelonious Monk records. And uh, the other night we were in New York and a friend of mine was playing in a club and the great, great uh, jazz trumpeter Randy Brecker was playing, used to be in the he used to play with his brother, the Brecker brothers. Yeah. But, you know, just to see somebody who can do that, who's it's different, but it's so musical and powerful. Uh, that I, 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 I like doing that stuff. Right, right. So it, you, you must have toured the UK quite a number of times. You talked about Glasgow and well, in, in Ireland as well. Where are, the, where are the other places that you always like to play? Is there anywhere in particular? Um, well, it, it, as far as the UK goes, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the London show is obviously the, the biggie, uh, in the same way that if you're in the States playing in New York or Los Angeles would be, you know, when you play in the capital, that's a, that's a nerve wracking, exciting, thrilling thing. Right. And I've played in some great venues there. Um, but, you know, I'm going to play, I think I'm going to play in a place called a working man's club up in, is it, is a town called Hebden? Yeah, Hebden yes, Bridge. He- he- Hebden yeah. Bridge. I know yeah. that place. I know that, I, I know that place. It's terrific yeah. venue. It's really fantastic Yeah, venue. well, I've done that before and I'm looking forward to going back up there and 
you know, that's a much smaller venue and, uh, and, um, but the audience is so enthusiastic and uh, uh, happy that you're there and uh, it's a lovely place to play. Right, right. Right. So you're looking forward to it, even though you're not looking forward to the traveling in between. I was going to ask you if you had any, any tips for travelers based on the fact that you've had to do so much traveling in the course of your working life. Tips for travelers. Yeah, how do you uh, occupy the time on, 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 on trains and planes and automobiles? Well, you know, uh, in the old days, I would just be close my eyes and sleep off the hangover. <laughs> But, uh, you know, now I, I, uh, I, I read and, uh, uh, you know, look out the window. I, I, you know, I just, uh, I just uh, try to get there in one piece. Uh, I don't have any tips. I, uh, I suppose there are some great drugs you can use now. Get some good gummies. That would be my, my advice. <laughs> have you Kids. got any more old records there that you haven't showed us? Let's see. Let's have a look at the pile. Yeah. I showed the Roger Miller. Let's go back. Are you hip to the, the Leuven brothers? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Great, yes. great country. Ira and the other brother is, uh, this Charles. is great, great, great country music. Um, what else? Oh, let's get a little more contemporary. <laughs> this is a record I love. Bob Marley and the Whalers, Catch All a right. Fire. All Catch right. a fire. Fantastic. I remember <laughs> living living in the in the Chateau Marmont in in Hollywood in the in the mid seventies. Uh, now I'm giving a, a, away the secrets of my my uh, checkered past, but you know, getting somewhat in um, my changing my consciousness in the middle of the day. Let's just say that. Who else and was we, living there at the time? God. Donald Sutherland was there uh, in doing a movie. Uh, yeah. A lot of actors were there. Uh, Maximilian Schell was there. Uh, you know, in those days, it was a very affordable place. Uh, now it's, you know, $600 a night. But um, some very hip jazz. Eric Dolphy out to lunch. Oh, right. oh yeah. 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 Impress your friends. Hold up an Eric Dolphy record. <laughs> Steely Dan, my favorite American, uh, you know, that and uh, uh, Little Feet are my two, uh, you know, they're, they're contemporaries of mine. But uh, I, I mentioned that I don't like to listen to other people's songs and music, but I, I, I couldn't resist this stuff. And I actually knew Donald Fagan. We lived before, but pre Steely Dan, we lived in a, a hippie crash pad in San Francisco in 1967. Nobody had any idea that he was a musician until one day we went to a macrobiotic restaurant called the Good Karma Cafe. <laughs> and there was an old beat up, up upright piano in the corner and, and Donald Fagan walked over and just started to play this amazing Ray Charles song. We all looked at each other like, holy shit, that's pretty cool. And look what happened to him. So, have you ever read his fantastic memoir? I, I have read it, and I it's think it is so one, good. One, of, one of the really great ones. Yeah, it is. It really gives you the, an impression of just what what touring and 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 yeah. uh, the whole experience really just being a, being a, being a rock star is like. It's amazing. Yeah, so no, you, it's, it's, you, you just knew him as a guy you shared a place with, and you did you didn't know any of the musical stuff at all. No, I, I had no idea. And then That's later amazing. on, uh, uh, Steely Dan opened for me once. This is before. <laughs> A lot of people have opened for me once. Oh, go on, tell us yeah. more. Go, go on. on. Let's, let's, see, see. let's see. Jackson Brown opened for me <laughs> oh, once. Brilliant, brilliant. Ruf Rufus Wainwright opened for me <laughs> once. <laughs> you mentioned you mentioned uh, Bob Dylan earlier. And yeah, I have to mention there was a time when it went, you know, for about six months, there were, a, there were a whole load of new Bob Dylans. And I'm afraid you were one of them, weren't you? Yeah, well, I like to. I consider myself the first new Bob Dylan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, so who uh, were yeah, who were the other ones? Prine, John Prine, John Prine, Steve Forbert was certainly yes. in the club. Yeah, um, yeah. There was a great singer songwriter. I think he's still. I, I think he might even live in Paris. Elliot Murphy. Elliot Remember Murphy him? was one of them. Yes, I do. <laughs> uh, a really interesting guy called David Foreman, who's. Uh, 
who's now a backup singer who actually sings on my new album. He, for a while, he was in the new Bob Dylan club. And of course that guy from New Jersey. Yes. yes he probably was. Whatever happened played, to him. Yeah, played yeah, the harmonica. Yeah, he, that's right. You know, so I make a joke about uh, we, every year we meet, uh, we, uh, we, all us new Bob Dylan's gather and we go to Bruce's house because he has the biggest house. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, Loud, it's been fantastic talking to you. Great talking uh, to you guys. We should end with and the greatest record ever made. We yeah, what would you say is the greatest record ever made? Yeah. Uh, is that something you have a, a, a flip answer to or a serious God. answer to? It doesn't matter. I, I it don't could know. Be that one I, of those that you've already held up on. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I could pick, pick one. That would be tough. I mean, the song, the, the thing. The song that's coming into my mind is a song which a very obscure, strange, beautiful, poetic Roger Miller song that people, everybody should hear. Certainly anybody who's in any kind of a relation, romantic relationship. It's a song called Husbands and Wives. And I just heard it on, I was listening to Sirius Radio the other day and it came, came up and it just stunned me as to what a gem of a song that is. So right. that's. I'll, I'll nominate that as the greatest song ever written. Very good. That's that's terrific. Well, look, thanks very much. And, you know, as we say, good luck with the tour. We look, <laughs> right. look forward to seeing you, seeing you in the UK in September. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view.